Great. So, uh, I mean, this is a real honor and pleasure to have the chance to do this. Um, so to quickly introduce myself, uh, my name is Harry Meadley. I'm a skateboarder, artist, um, and PhD researcher at the minute at Leeds Beckett University. Uh, as a sort of very quick route to, to where I am now and how things have tied together. Uh, and I think also explain some of why I'm now working on the project I'm going to talk about is I began like many as a skateboarder and through that uh, making skate videos, making websites, you know, being sort of part of the culture, writing about skateboarding at a very, relatively early age, that led me to pursuing uh, art school. I went to art school because, you know, I had a portfolio of skate website stuff and videos and and that got me into art school and and there I discovered conceptual art and contemporary art and and that took me off on a sort of career path let's say or a different sort of life pursuit uh for about you know 10 to 15 years something along that lines and I, I always kept my art making and skateboarding quite separate they were almost two separate worlds in my life um but as my artistic practice has developed over the years it's become much more around uh, primarily to do with access to galleries and municipal art galleries and public art galleries and how they can maybe better connect with uh, broader communities, broader audiences, um, and almost reclaim them a little bit as public space and think about how you gain more people access, not just as visitors, but as participants or exhibitors within those spaces. And that's naturally started to progress into just public space more broadly. And then being a skateboarder, obviously you have a natural interest in access to public spaces, out, especially city center, urban spaces, public owned, whatever, right? Like we, we as skateboarders always want to occupy those spaces and we're the often the most excluded from them or one of the groups most excluded from them. So that's led to uh, me bringing these two worlds together. And I've been working on a commission for what is a uh, year of culture, uh, Leeds 2023 year of culture. And as a, a little bit of background, um, Leeds was applying to be European, um, you know, for the European year of culture award, but due to Brexit, all the UK countries were disqualified. Uh, and I think we were like in the semi-final pick or the final shortlist. And so the city decided that, okay, well, unfortunately due to Brexit, we're no longer eligible, but the city is gonna attempt to do it on its own. So it's almost like a DIY year of culture, which in itself is quite interesting. And, and with it has come a, a much more strong narrative about sort of co-created locally produced projects or things generating from the city, as opposed to maybe the normal approach to years of culture where it's big budget things hired in internationally to the city. Um, and so for the last couple of years or year and a half, I would say, I've been working uh, with the Leeds skateboard community, of which I am part as a sort of artist on a socially engaged practice. Um, and so this paper, which was originally submitted and presented uh, at the Stoke Sessions conference in San Diego earlier this year, uh, and it has a relatively melodramatic title, my PhD supervisor, because I'd never written abstract before, and they said, oh, you need a bit of a sort of spicy title. Um, so it's called Civic Skateboarding, which is the name of the project, reframing, reframing street skating through socially engaged art practice in order to weaponize cultural institutions in an attempt to decriminalize skateboarding in Leeds, UK. And if you're not that familiar with Leeds, uh, it's uh, I think it's maybe the fourth or fifth biggest city in the north of England um, and is sort of quite a big university um city you know we, I think there's four art schools here it's a big sort of lots of students and things like that and has a really sort of active and quite inclusive skateboard community um so I'm gonna start uh with the initial part of this project so it was it began as a as a sort of seed funded developmental thing with the idea that they could be picked up as bigger commissions uh so last April uh we delivered uh, and I say we because it's a sort of co-created project um an event which was about partnering between uh, a female and non-binary skate collective in the city called Rolling with the Girls and Leeds Playhouse, which is a big sort of, uh, you know, theatre, quite big institution in the city and a long-standing famous skate spot. Um, and so that led to the first, in our city at least, sort of permitted safe uh, skate session in a, in a street spot in the city centre. 
uh, and it was made exclusively for female and gender minority skateboarders to access. So I'm just going to show you a little clip from that event just to give you a sense of, of what it was like. Um, and just a couple of little notes about that video. It was made by a skateboarder and filmmaker in Leeds called Hilda Quick, who's a, among one of the few skate filmers in the UK who are female, you know, and actually in that event, we made sure to have cameras for the participants to film each other and get a bit of experience in filming because though um, skateboarding is maybe moving more in terms of gender uh, parity with its participants, uh, those who are documenting, disseminating, it is still overwhelmingly male dominated. So it's sort of also looking at chances how we can introduce that. Um, so this event was like super positive, was really nice, took a lot of work, even though for like a one hour little thing to happen. Uh, and it was born out of really a, a longer consultation period and, and sort of research, um, you know, through surveys and focus groups and things like that that led up to it. Uh, because as an artist, when you are having to work with a community, that's a really valuable thing, right? Like you have to spend a lot of time actually trying to understand it, understand the needs, the dreams, the hopes uh, and the issues. Uh, and even though it was a community I'm a part of and very sort of connected to, um, it still was like, OK, there's a whole new world. There's a whole new group of skateboarders, especially younger female and non-binary skaters who've really taken it up in recent years. Uh, and through conversations and consultations with them, certain things really started to stand out. And it felt like unless we really tackle these issues, doing any sort of other sort of big public skate event was, is like meaningless, right? Unless there's not people that feel like they can really access and participate in it. Um, so a lot of this research was published in a zine called the um, Leeds Street Skating Survey that was sort of released at that event and um, designed by... Izzy Almond, who's a really amazing female skater in Leeds as well. Uh, and there was just a few things that sort of stood out from this research, which has been quite valuable in informing how we've moved ahead. So the first thing was that actually we had loads of people undertake the survey in a sort of census. Uh, and we realized that a quarter of the skate scene was actually sort of, well, mainly female and a few non-binary, but was a proportion far higher than people anticipated and far higher than anyone sort of observes. If you go to the main skate parks, if you go to the main skate spots, it's still a lot of male skaters. Yes, there are female skaters that are there and you notice, but it's not one in four, where in actuality that was the numbers that were coming through. And so there was a, a very big um, contingency of female skaters that were skating, but quite invisibly from the rest of the skate scene and obviously from the public as well. Um, and that really was sort of uh, information in itself was valuable moving ahead. Um, and then we looked at safety. So obviously gaining accounts, unfortunately, of lots of really bad instances that skateboarders have experienced at the hands of security guards and police officers. Um, but again, things that often go unevidenced or unrecorded, right? Because you as a skateboarder are understand you're not really supposed to be there maybe you don't feel you have recourse to complain when you're mistreated um and alongside that looking at okay well how can these spaces be redeveloped and made safer uh and even a little bit more of a fun breakdown of like favorite skate spots what is good not good about them and actually in terms of like which gender uh, whether female male or non-binary respond to different skate spots in the city center which was quite sort of eye-opening um so this led to a sort of two-pronged uh, development. One was this taking over the space, organizing this partnership with the Playhouse uh, and having this skate event, and then also establishing this idea of civic skateboarding. So rethinking street skating as civic skateboarding. So the idea that skateboarders are actively engaged as citizens in the use and uh, administration of the spaces they occupy and how we might sort of work towards that. 
Uh, and we were able early on in this project to have a really great opportunity to uh, have a an official uh, consultation for the architects redeveloping and uh, the city square in Leeds, uh, and have like female and non-binary skaters actually voice like what they would want, how they would want to see it done. And fingers crossed, some of that will actually be taken up by the architects in the design because officially they are supposed to respond to that. Um, and the important thing to say is that a lot of what I'm going to talk about, and obviously I'm the one here talking about it, but it's come from the the community from the group uh the sort of core focus group we developed with rolling with the girls um this is not all of them but this is Siv, Jazz, Ananya, Izzy who's done the design work and Becca um and the reason I have these screen grabs is one of the strategies we made through conversations we identified okay Leeds Playhouse is the skate spot they really want to be in um historically the security have been some are okay some are not okay it's a bit ambiguous but that's sort of a really space more than anything they wanted to occupy and skate in. Um, so we produced just a short video of them filming themselves talking about how much they love skating the playhouse and how it means to them. Uh, I did sort of promise I would never show anyone else the video because I think they would feel a bit embarrassed. Um, but when I met with the director of the playhouse and, and showed him this video, um, he literally was like tearing up a little bit and sort of said, you know, I've never heard anyone talk so lovingly about the playhouse. And then and then I have to acknowledge that they're not even talking about the inside of the building. They're talking about the bits of stone outside. And I think that connection really opened them up to thinking about how can we better support and understand and connect with the skateboard community. And in fact, when we sort of met like the community engagement officers and things like that, They'd said, oh, we've always wanted to engage with the skateboarders outside there, but we didn't know how. We didn't know who the point of access was because obviously the groups change. It was a bit sometimes maybe even intimidating for them to go up to a bunch of skateboarders and say, hey, you know, we work here, community engagement, blah, blah. Um, and a big part of what I've found to be really valuable is actually showing people who skateboarders really are and how skateboarders as a, as a group, as a culture, as a demographic has changed. And also the creative side to it that I think a lot of people in the creative arts, you know, industry or cultural institutions can really connect with. Um, but then you have the natural problem of public space, right? So just as a quick example, this is the, the, the Playhouse skate spot um, running through the center of it. Uh, to the right is the Playhouse um, and they own about 12 foot out from their building into this land and then on the left is a Leeds City College and it's actually their sort of arts building and they own part of this. Um, the central area is uh, publicly owned but managed by the council and through their parks department as well uh, and then identified here in pink this is really the main like skate spot area though. so it sits across all three parts and that relationship between those free institutions is, is a complex thing. However, one of the sort of important strategies that we've, we've thought about is that, well, if two out of three of those owners have a vested interest in supporting the skate community that inhabit it, then maybe the other slightly has to back down, right? Or has to at least respond to this issue. Um, so really think about how we can form partnerships with these sort of creative institutions, these cultural institutions to support the skateboarders has become really valuable. Um, that being said, the event was super positive, really, uh, like really amazing, fun time, felt very sort of meaning and significant. Um, but as a sort of interesting anecdote, the Leeds City Council on their sort of internal newsletter featured it as like a good news story, like, wow, look at these, you know, female skateboarders taking over the Playhouse, this really positive event with Leeds 2023. Um, but because it was sent to every member of staff in the council, then naturally there was a couple of like the old grumpy men who hate skateboarders and, and really kicked off and actually sort of wanted the council officer who'd supported it disciplined and sort of said, okay, we're not going to give you permission to do any sort of events like this in future, um, which is sort of a bit, a bit worrying. So, you know, it, it, even though you do these positive things, there is still that resistance there. And I think that resistance is waning, but unfortunately at least in Leeds really still exists within the council we're operating with um so where I think we have a chance to to sort of break down some of that resistance is is through funding right and through sort of art 
art funds, commissions, cultural funding. Um, and so Leeds 2023, just as an example, uh, this was the artist brief. I know you probably can't read it on, on your screens, but this was the artist brief for the commission that I was asked to do. Um, and I think it's sort of representative of a change in arts funding, at least in the UK, but I think is appearing more and more across the board globally, that really arts funding needs to demonstrate that it is actually engaging, supporting and benefiting communities and introducing this really strong notion of co-creation, right? So you're not just making single people, making single objects and sticking them in rooms or performances or one-off things, that actually you're involving people in the process and actually identifying local communities. Interestingly, for most galleries, museums, theatres, whatever, the most local community is skateboarders, right? They're literally on their doorstep. Um, and often are really cool, amazing, interesting, young, creative people of all sorts of genders, ethnicities, religions, whatever, right? So it's like, for them, it's almost like a, a bit of a gold mine. if it's, you know, slightly maybe unfair to say that. But from their perspective, I think skateboarders offer a real um, asset and almost we can dangle ourselves in front of them a little bit. Um, my response to this open call or for this commission, interestingly, was quite like bolshy from, from my behalf because um, I felt in our city, at least, and we were doing this year of culture and their tagline was letting culture loose. Um, interestingly, skateboarders are this incredibly rich cultural activity, especially I would, I would argue street skateboarding. Um, but is one of the most sort of suppressed, right? Whether that's through bylaws, through whatever, uh, security, police, all sorts of things, right? Um, and I had to sort of articulate that um, if, if we're about supporting communities, this is actually quite a vulnerable and quite a sort of marginalized or oppressed community in the city, especially given the young nature of a lot of it, their participants. Um, and I think it was like, also a, an amazing coincidence that whilst they were making the selection for these commissions, the Olympics was on and skateboarding was in there and Sky Brown was a big deal. And, um, you know, I think there was a sort of wave of enthusiasm behind skateboarding that this project has been able to ride. Um, jumping a little bit sideways or a little bit more about myself. Um, so I'm currently doing a practice-based part-time PhD as my tied in with my role as a lecturer in fine art. Um, and as an artist, and I guess through my research, though the skateboarding in the public space is a lot related to the outcomes of it, internally in terms of methodology or practice, I'm sort of interested in the role of the artist or that license or access that the role of the artist allows for. And arguably unfairly, um, it's sort of a quite a, a, a plump, plumped up uh, social role or at least sort of civic role. Um, and I think that the payoff is that you don't ever really earn that much money, right, like as an artist, but you, you're given access and prestige and power in a way that uh, many people are not. And I've sort of split this into two notions, which is artist as cash cow and artist as scapegoat, which I'll try to just explain a little bit and as to, into why I think there's, there's sort of more that maybe artists could do to support skateboarding. So... And this is a bit bit chaotic, but I, I've tried to image um, how the the flow of money and sort of funds flow around in a project like this um, and really sort of understand the way it works. And essentially, a lot of that is about where does the money come from? Councils, definitely in the UK with successive years of conservative governments have had their budgets just stripped and stripped and stripped. So they're always looking for, can they access funding for various sort of positive public uh, events or, or things to happen to support the city? And a lot of that comes through arts funding. Um, that often goes a bit to paying artists into art institutions, into events like Leeds 2023. Um, but doesn't always directly go to communities as well. And so something that I've been quite conscious of in the development of this project is thinking about whatever funding I can get and access, how can that actually be channeled into the community, into skateboarders in the city as well, so they actually see a legitimate benefit from um, their participation in adding value to the city. Uh, and really at the centre of all of this is the public spaces. And because the councils are the main managers of these public spaces, they are almost 
the only ones who really put money into maintaining them, into building them, into developing and whatever. And that makes them maybe have a sense of ownership over it when in actuality they're publicly owned, they're publicly owned spaces and the council manages them on the public's behalf. But the perception both by the public and by the council is maybe that the council only spaces. So in this dynamic, I think what I've been interested about is like, what is the sort of gap that allows you to shift that power balance? And I think where the artist has a sort of interesting role in this is there is a lot of precedence for public art. So traditionally, that's big sculptures, that's whatever. But public um, artists through arts funding are able to make quite big interventions physically into public spaces. And there's lots of pre precedence for that. And I'm interested in, well, what if you change the art? So what if public sculpture is no longer a big statue of whatever, but is actually about maybe refurbishing or making the spaces scalable. Um, just as a really small example, uh, that same ledge that featured in the Playhouse video is sort of naturally, I mean, it wasn't built very well. It's sort of not cemented. It's just sat on sand, so it fell apart a little bit. Um, but we just got together and we reset it, re-cement it, filled it in and make it really solid so more people can enjoy it and it doesn't look like it's getting damaged, which obviously council people worry about. Um, when I have actually met and explained to council people that skateboarders do this, that we actually fix skate spots, um, they were like totally shocked and it really broke their, um, maybe some of their prejudices about skateboarders, that it was like, oh wait, you're fixing our spaces? Um, and I think I'm sort of interested in, okay, can we take that to a, a, a further level maybe? Um, Going back a little bit, obviously, we don't have an event like Leeds 2023 next year. It's a one-off thing. So as a model, more broadly, this is what you would be sort of looking at. Um, and I think the error or the worry I have in this model is where is the link to continuing to support the community? And so what I've been sort of also looking at and thinking about is how do you start to make the funders fund skateboarding directly as a creative act um so one example that i have of that so far is that we were able to make an application to what's known as the national lottery community fund so we have a big lottery that then money from that goes into the arts council england as well as sort of various community funds and what's interesting about the national lottery community fund is they explicitly don't fund sport um, so a lot of, say, indoor skate parks or skateboard projects or things like that have always really struggled to access this funding because as soon as they see, oh, oh OK, uh, skateboarding, that's to do with the Olympics, that has to come out of Sport England who funds sports stuff, so we won't fund that. And what's been interesting is to re-articulate skateboarding, not as a sport, but as a community activity, as a creative activity, um, and being able to attach it to cultural events to arts institutions to other arts funders like has really amazingly overwritten that so we were we were successful in getting quite a lot of money to fund um a program that we'll be running this summer called street skate together which is going to be uh 10 like group street skating going out into the city mainly focused for female gender minority beginners and ally skateboarders who maybe don't feel as confident being in those spaces um, and to sort of equip them maybe with the experience and know how to, to engage in, in street skating a bit more confidently. Um, and that, this is a really interesting thing because we're, we are just skateboarding. It is the act of skateboarding that has been funded as a community development tool. And I think, you know, we're starting to see more precedents like this. I've noticed a couple of other sort of skateboard projects in the UK are getting Arts Council funding. And so it's like when you start to establish these precedents, all of a sudden people can cite that and then access that funding as well. And I think what I'm interested in is how can we continue to build upon experiences of, or can we build upon other skateboard initiatives realizing that they are able to, if they frame themselves more in this way, access support and funding um, from the sort of art side of things, at least in the UK, I can't talk for everywhere. Um, so that's the sort of artist as cash cow, right? Like you are a, a, a role that can attract funding and attract money, even if you at the end of the day end up personally with very little of it. Um, but that's all, all part of the fun and commitment to it. 
Um, so artist as scapegoat is the other side of this, which is really to do with blame. Um, and I think one thing I think is really valuable is with larger institutions is having someone else to blame. So this previous set of skate sessions that we've organized and we're running through the city, uh, they're all happening without permission, without consent from the council, without consent from the spaces we're going to, right? It's been explicitly done against the bylaws, against whatever. Um, but if something happens, if something goes wrong, it's like I'm the one who can be blamed. It's not Leeds 2023, it's not National Lottery, it's not whoever. It's like, oh, it's the artist has done this, they've gone a bit rogue, they can be blamed. And I think that's a really valuable tool um, and they're almost like a bit of the trade-off. And for me, the, the thing that matters most is the community, are the skateboarders who you know I share the city with. Uh, but thankfully, I do feel like you know anything that sort of goes wrong or if there are any issues or failures in this project, they will blame the council, right? So I think I, as long as I'm off the hook with the community, then I, it's it's all good, um, and I'm I'm happy to accept you know whatever whatever may come from from trying to do this sort of work. But then flipping that a little bit and looking at like, well, what is actually to blame for a lot of these issues in our city, at least, and this is true for a lot of cities in the UK. Uh, we have council bylaws and bylaws are a sort of ambiguous, not really a real law. They're almost never uh, prosecuted or all that enforced across the board, um, but they're really meant so the council can put up a sign and can say, we don't want this happening here. Um, uh, they're there to discourage ultimately. And I think one of the issues that we've uh, identified, especially for a lot of consultation is, um it's the ambiguity which is a problem you know some security guards some police officers will just go oh it's fine go and skate go and do whatever but others it almost enables them for abuses of power right they are sort of um empowered by the fact that they have this law behind them that gives them the right to sort of physically if in theory physically remove skateboarders and in that process can you know we have accounts of them dislocating people's shoulders hitting them with cars all sorts of racial and sexist verbal abuse in the process. And then, then there's no real recourse for that. And equally trying to do any sort of positive events around skateboarding in public spaces is almost impossible because any conversation you try to have with the council, even members of the council who are in support of what you might want to do have to sort of go, well, there's a bylaw and we can't do anything because of a bylaw. So the long-term goal of this as a project, and I think also this is an artwork is about removing that bylaw even if it takes I don't know 100 years or something um, but this has sort of become quite central that it's actually about policy change rather than can we just do more and more positive exciting good events which obviously we'll continue to do but fundamentally if you're not making changes to these policies and to these laws we're never going to be able to really achieve anything that um, transformative um, and so this bylaw is from Millennium Square, which is this area in the centre of Leeds, uh, in front of the Civic Hall. And this is a space where I'm, I've been spending the last year uh, with various sort of partners, whether that's Leeds 2023, other arts institutions, doing what we can to try and sort of lobby the council to consider even giving us access to skate in this space. With I mean, people skate here all the time, but with permission and to sort of maybe break down the enforcements of some of these laws um and one thing just as a sort of interesting anecdote uh, that's become a real hurdle is their concern over the damage to the steps to the stone um this is the sort of you know the main steps and facade and interestingly no one really skated these steps or grinded on them until they put skate stoppers all over them actually adding the skate stoppers making them into these smaller sections made it a more interesting thing to skate whereas prior to that no one ever bothered it was sort of they're not actually that nice to grind um but you know this is again an example of an intervention to stop something actually encouraging it uh, and going back a little bit to millennium square an interesting anecdote when this was built you know it was a millennium project to redevelop this area um the then head of the council spent quarter of a million pounds uh, building a new skate park just outside the city centre called Hyde Park to remove skateboarders from this space. And interestingly, they could have not 
I mean, in, in a way, it was good that they built that skate park, but it just meant there were more skateboarders who then would migrate into town and skate that skate spot. So it didn't necessarily solve their problem. Um, and they could have quite easily spent, I don't know, £25,000. They could have spent 10% of that and just accepted that, okay, some stone might get a little bit damaged, but we'll we'll have a budget to help repair it when damage happens over the next 20 years. So it's also thinking about how can we start to articulate to them more simple and less um, sort of destructive methods of, of maintaining these spaces. Uh, and I, I had to also personally admit that I'm probably responsible for about a third of the damage to that one step. I'm like, probably the main person that skates it so it felt like a bit of a personal um you know I don't know like karma maybe coming back to me because this one little issue has been the main thing that's allowed resistance to what we're trying to achieve um, and one thing that uh has really become apparent and I think this is an experience that a lot of people has is that we have this dynamic of sort of antagonism between whether it's authority figures, security, the council and skateboarders. Uh, this is a photograph I took in 2004 at Millennium Square in front of the Civic Halls of a security guard like flipping me off. Um, I personally liked it because it reminded me of the opening to This Is Skateboarding. I don't know, you know, with the Heathcote chart and the security guards saying we don't want you here, get off the tree. Um, but this is something that I think is exemplary of what we need to also break down internally in the skateboard community where right? we have a legacy of antagonism with these institutions and skateboarding itself has radically changed and developed and i would argue enlightened in many ways um since that point in time but the institutions that we're engaging with haven't yet done that they, they've not updated their perception of skateboarders and i think some of the work we have to all think about is how can we seek to do that so this is manifesting in a, a sort of large public event I'm organizing for mid-September. Uh, this is just a little overview of the sort of proposal I have to give to the council to try and explain what we're doing. Um, but is the idea that we can sort of take over the city or almost like a mini festival of skateboarding that is unlike an event like Copenhagen Open, for example, which prioritizes, you know, big pro skaters, big exciting ramps, and arguably a, it would be a very enjoyable thing. But I'm interested in, can we do a, a sort of large city center skate event that actually is about being as, as, as inclusive as possible and that skateboarders are not just spectators, but active participants, um, and that we, sort of break down almost like the hierarchy of spectatorship so thinking about skate events that are more accessible for the newer generations or um older generations of skateboarders who you know want to have their moment and be celebrated in the way that maybe happens in most skateboard events in, in sort of more skate industry worlds and just as one example of one of the things we're working on is the last part of this talk. So this is the Henry Moore Institute, which is a sort of center for sculpture in Leeds um, and a really popular skate spot. Um, mainly this is this ledge known as the Henry Moore ledge, a sort of ride on grind. Um, it's quite a sort of accessible skate spot because you're not having to pop onto it. You can ride off it. Um, and it's quite popular as a sort of spot with female skaters, beginners, um, and is, yeah, just a really all-around fun thing to skate. The, the Henry Moore Institute has had a sort of relatively um, unofficial, informal acceptance of skateboarders as long as they're there when the building is closed. There was a long-standing security guard who just was like, okay, you guys, if you come when the place is closed, it's fine, you can skate here. But naturally, it's sort of, you know, the ledge gets a bit damaged, gets worn down, and... Um, and it's a grade two listed building. So it has to be sort of architecturally preserved. Um, and unfortunately for them and for skateboarders, each one of these tiles is from one special quarry in Italy and cost about 2000 pounds per like square foot or something. The crazy import costs, it's a really complicated thing. And so they have a, a difficult dynamic where even though they maybe want to support skateboarders, it has a real sort of financial implication for them from the damage to this because they're legally uphold to, to maintain and restore it. However, they have a sort of caveat in their um, 
listed status because they're a sculpture center that they're allowed to make interventions into the facade for the sake of the display of sculpture um, and what we've been working on is the idea that I'm going to claim that ledge as a ready-made public sculpture and we're going to refurbish the top part that people skate with a similar but slightly cheaper and more affordable material uh, as a as a sort of long-term temporary sculpture so if it gets damaged it's easier and cheaper cheaper for it to be replaced and doesn't interfere with their things so it's sort of this idea that can we claim uh, skate spots as public sculptures as artworks uh, as a way to preserve them both for skateboarders and physically as a material because sometimes anything more older or significant is is protected and that's one of the real problems they have even if there are support there but what's really been interesting is that observing, well, what won over the Henry Moore Institute? Yes, I met with them and talked with them, but there's been some examples that sort of sent jolts through them. And one of them is that there's a skateboarder in Leeds called Joe Allen, who makes really amazing skate videos. Um, he has a tattoo of the Henry Moore ledge on his leg. And when he posted this just to Instagram, or in fact, it was a skateboarder, a tattoo artist who, who posted it, um, the the staff in the Henry Moore Institute just were like mind blown. They just didn't, you know, it was like, why have you, why has someone got a tattoo of the bit of stone outside the front of our building? Um, and that really opened them up to dialogue about the, the real significance of it, which maybe they hadn't quite picked up other than knowing like, oh, there's some skateboarders out there. And this has been really valuable in understanding that one failing I think we have as, as skateboarders and as a skateboard community is that we're incredibly good at sharing um and documenting ourselves internally as a community but maybe as a way of self-preservation historically because we've presumed a sort of public and, and municipal antagonism from ourselves we've never really advocated or promoted ourselves outside of skateboarding and i think this is where we can think about the role of artists or the role of skateboarders operating more like artists in how can we produce and communicate things to broader publics um and what really sealed the deal when I met with the Henry Moore Institute was I was able to show them a video clip from a video that Joe Allen, who has this tattoo made um, called Patank that was released in 2021, um, which I'm just going to share with you because it's, uh, it's one of my favorite moments in a skate video at, of all time anyway, but um, maybe you'll see why they responded so well to it. So that's a skateboarder in Leeds called Mini. Um, very beautiful moment in the film, uh, riding a 5-0 grind and being sort of celebrated. And again, I think people don't see this, right? They see the skateboarders lurking around, trying things, not landing it, or not realizing that there are sort of aims and ambitions and, and sort of goals to a lot of what people are doing. Um, and I think the more we can sort of show that the reasons and the meaning behind why we skate and especially why we street skateboard or why we try these things and, and what meaning it actually has for people the better I think we can sort of win people over in that process um, and then just as a sort of last little addition one year later for a separate video made by Hilda Quick who I showed a clip from the things she did for us earlier uh, the final trick was also at the Henry Moore Institute and a sort of a great example of the progression that happens within skateboarding even one year later. Um, and it also has this lovely little shot of Connie Gascoigne, who we'll see in a second, uh, being fist bumped by a random member of the public who's like what maybe I would refer to as like a meathead, right? And 15, 20 years ago, when I would have been skating this spot as a young teenager, that's the maybe the sort of person I would have been terrified of engaging with. And I think what's wonderful to see in the way that skateboarding has changed and the dynamic and the sort of gender parity of skateboarding has altered, that the public have become much more accepting and understanding of it. And I think actually the value that we can achieve from greater public awareness and, and connection will, will only benefit us more broadly. Um, but anyway, I'll play the clip. Survive, don't care.
so I'm just going to end lastly just with an invitation um, I know you're very very far away but if you happen to find yourself in the UK in September the event uh, civic skateboarding will be happening on the 16th and 17th of September where amongst unveiling the newly renovated uh, Henry Moore Institute Ledger Public Escape, uh, Sculpture as well as lots of different skate sessions and things um, I'll hopefully have a few more exciting things to reveal uh, if you'd be interested in sort of following that a little bit more closely we'll be doing a lot of it documented and covered through the website civic leads um, and on instagram at civic leads uh, thank you all very very much